Welcome back to the channel. Another package came in and I bought this off of eBay for I think 160 shipped. Oh, okay. That does not look good. Using just some cardboard box as packing material is a bad idea. Very, very bad idea. Especially when shipping heavy material. It's an Amiga 2000. Ooh, fancy. I had some of these, but well, let's uh, get it out of there and uh, check it out. I might have overpaid on this. Okay, so let's do a first inspection. This looks all okay. Someone had some stickers here and some stickers here and a drive here. And we can still see the ports, but they are a little bit uplifted. So that isn't good. Then if we look at this from above, we can see that it has a little, little dent here, so it doesn't go quite straight, but it has a little curve. We have a missing screw on this side. And we have two different screws on this side. And we have the back side, which, ay 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 ay, that does not look good. That is not supposed to be like this. Oh man, that board looks crunched. I fear for the worst here. Oh man, another, another screw up here. I hope I can at least save the case and the power supply, but the board does not look good. That is, this is just horrible. And that here, this little mountain top here, can't be good. Poo, okay, let's uh, open it up and take a look inside. Okay, I opened up the machine and the first thing that happened was this fell out and this looks professionally fixed with uh, some, uh, we call this tizza film, which is just some sticky tape. Uh, everything seems a bit not quite straight. Let's call it that. Uh, there was a water at some point, which has been removed. There's no corrosion on the slots as far as I can see. Yeah, there's no drive cable, just somehow hanging in there because that standoff is definitely way too high. Man. Okay, I'm a little scared to switch, to just switch this on because the board seems so weirdly bent from the back side. If you can see that the ports. Okay, I guess it's time to do a little disassembly here and uh, take some things out and check how the board looks underneath. I just noticed there are two definitely not stock screws here and no screws down here so that power supply is just hanging in there. Okay, so here's our first look at the board. This looks so far so good. The water did some damage, but it doesn't look too bad. Nobody cared to clean this. There's some corrosion up here, up here. CPU seems to be okay. Yeah, if you take a look at the board, it has some flex to it. So if you can see that on video, there's a little mountain top here. So I will remove the board from that and then we see what's underneath there because there's something here. Yeah, mystery solved. So someone didn't care to remove the screws before putting the board back in. So it seems that the board 
could be straightened out. That connector here is toast, but it may actually fit. What is this, a parallel or the floppy connector? I'm not sure. Um, that may be possible. That one looks pretty damaged. The case itself, yeah, has seen better days. So that is has fallen down somewhere. But all in all, that doesn't look too bad. So I guess I can fix this. So first thing to do is to um, try the power supply. Hope that it doesn't explode. Check for voltages. And uh, yeah, then we go from there. On a hunch, I just opened the power supply. And uh, yeah, first I, th I just saw this pretty blackened fuse. And then I noticed this, which looks also pretty black. Hmm. That doesn't look good. Cable looks good. Everything else looks good, but that definitely doesn't. Okay, so am I willing to fix this or am I just going to put in a modern power supply? Something like uh, Pico power supply and just uh, use the cables because these Pico power supplies are fanless, they are much more compact and they give all the voltages we need, I guess. I have to check again, but uh, that should actually work. Yeah, so uh, no testy testy until we bring this back to life. And man, that looks crunchy in there. So since I didn't get too far on the power supply side of things, I decided to check out the corrosion on the board. And well, I said it wasn't so bad, but it turns out it's pretty bad. It's even on the underside, you can see this greenish shit here and even there and then I pulled the CPU because uh, well one of the legs did stick out and I found this and you can see there's a leg missing there's a leg missing there's a leg missing and that is all corrosion so someone unloaded his shitty parts bin right onto me which is pretty uncool because uh, well if you sell something like this at least tell me in the description of your auction because I hate that kind of surprise but I definitely have to change the socket here because this is just gone I do have another 68k processor so that one I would say is gone and I might have to switch out that connector and maybe this connector not quite sure I will try to use a fiberglass pan to just scrap away some of the green but that does not look good and I have to come up with a power supply solution and I just saw that you can see there that looks like solder to me. So I guess someone soldered to these legs on probably some other Amiga and just put that in here, which is also very, very uncool. So that is the state of affairs, so to say. Okay, I brought out my stock A500, this beautiful model, which is not retro brighted, it's just cleaned and looks like new i think while i was checking out the motherboard here i noticed a few things first uh, the polar chip was just in half so most of the legs or all the legs on this side just were over the socket then i pulled the kickstart rom and i put a 2.0 kickstart sticker on this and you can see the legs are pretty bent or missing at all then I cleaned off some of the gunk over here. You can see there's pure copper. Um, the socket here is very corroded, so I have to switch that. And uh, my plan is to build a power supply to not use the standard Amiga 2000 power supply. But first, I want to go and pull all of the custom chips, or all socket chips, 
and try them as far as possible in my stock 500 to see if the chips are good. I know that my 500 is working, so we'll check that, of course, before. And then we will go from there. So my A500 is open, has the original Commodore uh, RAM expansion, where I have removed the battery, of course. And the first chip I tried was the Kickstart ROM. So this is a uh, spare Kickstart ROM I have flying around. So just to make sure that this actually works, I put this in here and lo and behold, it works. By the way, I'm using this black brick here, which we will get to in a future episode, which is the ultimate retro power supply. And as I said, I will get to that in a future episode. So let's. Okay, so the Kickstart ROM is good. Let's try the 2.0 Kickstart ROM, which has these ripped legs. I'm not very positive that these will do anything, but well, maybe I'm I'm wrong here. But the legs are so bent, and no, I'm not putting that into my socket. Uh, these look as if they are about to break off. So no, thank you, sir. I could actually put another socket under this. I put this in a the socket, then solder these broken broken legs to the socket and use that socket inside that socket but not now so for now we're going with the 1.3 kickstart rom so next up i would like to test Let's see maybe the Paula chip okay so there's our Paula, and that is the 8364r7 from week 3590 Okay, here's our Paula from the other board. It's the exact same chip, just a few weeks earlier. So let's check orientation. Let's see. That was a chip that was just not in there. Let's see what happens. And it seems to work. So let's put in a disk. That looks good for now. Let's try Denise. We have a Denise from 91 here, 40th week, 8362R8. And we have an 8362R8 in that machine. So I was actually able to save the Kickstart 2.0 ROM. And uh, turned out that the legs weren't ripped off. They were just totally crumbled together and I had to Use my tweezers here to uncrumble them and then I put it, put it into a socket. And you can see that on this side the legs are a bit flaky, but it works. Which is good news. Kickstart 2.0 ROM original saved. Nice. So I did disassemble the drive and uh, it's only a few screws. Didn't go totally deep into it. And I just took a look at the board and the caps. And then I recognized, uh, can you see it? Can you see it? This, this looks like a blown fuse. And I measured continuity and there is none. I'm not sure if this is really a fuse, but I'm going to desolder it and put a wire on it because this drive is toast anyway and it doesn't do anything and it looks like it's not even getting power so yeah that may actually work let's see so i removed the fuse and just hot wired this whole thing let me put this back together and see if it works So let me first give you an overview of what we have here. This is an Amiga 2000B motherboard, which is a Rev 3, no, 4.3. So all the Rev A or not Rev A. Um, so all the Amiga A models have a Rev 4.0 or just 4 or 4.1. And um, the Amiga 2000A models are based off the A1000 and were produced and um, designed in Germany 
and um, do have a few quirks that are not present in this, these boards. These boards are the Haney Fisher boards and they were designed in the US and they are based off the A500. So pretty much that part of the machine is A500-ish and this part right here is the expansion slots and stuff like that and that is of course not part of the um, Amiga 500. So um, what we have here is a stock A2000 with a um, 68,000 uh, Motorola processor with a Kickstart 2.0. I guess this was actually um, delivered with 2.0. We have, if I'm not completely mistaken, 512K of RAM right here. We have the um, original chipset, so not the um, special chips of the 600 and 1200, but the standard Amiga 500 chips. And this machine came in this case with this drive over there and that power supply over there. Missing screws. It has some battery damage. As you can see, the Vata which resided here was removed and uh, thankfully it wasn't too much. It's a bit was a bit greenish blue here. I removed all the stuff that was not good. Um, yeah, so the first thing I did was I took out all of the socketed custom chips and put them into an Amiga 500, which I knew worked. And that way I actually saw that all the chips are good. So there was no bad chip in here, which was good news because I don't have any spares except for these, which are stuck in my 500. So that was good. I didn't have a floppy cable and um, yeah, that was my first attempt of doing anything. So then I took a closer look at the board and uh, that made one thing very clear to me. And that was that someone used this machine or built this machine out of parts, which he had laying around just to create another A2000 to throw on the market. So this is not a machine that actually worked at any point uh, in its life. Um, the way it was assembled when I got it. Um, the screws were crooked, the drive, the disk drive, the original disk drive uh, was sitting like this and not like this, not straight, but like this in the case and just with one or two screws. Um, the board was screwed in only in two, at two places and it was a total mess. So I had to disassemble the whole machine and um, then I took another closer look at the board and I noticed that right here where you can see these um, tantalum caps, these orange ones. They were blue and um, some of these were broken. So I had to desolder these. I replaced this cap and I had to replace the CPU socket because that was green on, on these parts here. And I, I um, re had to remove this and replace the socket. And that was quite a struggle to get it uh, out of here because the solder on this thing is just abysmal. It's t totally, it's like uh, trying to solder um, to a plastic bottle. So it's really hard to do stuff here. So I had to actually solder one of these tantalum caps on top of the board, as you can see. It's just placed on top and then soldered like surface mount because I couldn't get the solder out of those holes. I struggled for half an hour and then I gave up. And then I got and took a look at the power supply and the power supply had a broken a blown fuse and it had some burnt resistors and I actually opened the power supply and replaced these parts but I'm not confident that I can really fix it I'm still waiting for the fuses to come in and at some point I decided to just use a standard ATX power supply which you can see here, which is not a standard ATX power supply, but one out of a five um, euro Dell um, machine, which resides over there, Dell Optiplex, whatever. And I had to cut the connector because this is a very specific individual Amiga connector from the original power supply over here, down there. 
and attach it to this. So this is now my new, this is now my new Amiga power supply. And there are a few things that you have to check because back in the day, the ATX power supplies had a minus five volt coming from here and the Amiga needs the minus five volt. And this power supply doesn't support or supply these. So instead of using one of these giant ATX power supply bricks, which I don't have, I simply got onto Amazon and ordered one of these, which is a five volts to minus five volts converter, which cost me five bucks. And you just plug it into the five volts here and it delivers minus five volts, which then go into this connector. So for 10 bucks, I have my replacement power supply. And uh, then I had to solder these um, drive connectors. So I have these and one of these goes to this and that is the power for my floppy. I even have SATA if I need one, um, but I don't. Yeah, so that is my power supply and it works like a charm. Then there's another thing and that is, you can see there's one wire, the brown one, which is not connected. And this is called a tick signal. And this tick signal is used to actually generate the video for the Amiga 2000. So if you don't have the tick signal, you can't generate, or the Amiga can't generate video. And for that, there's another jumper, which is um, this jumper down there, jumper 300. And there you can select that the Amiga doesn't get its tick signal from here, but I guess from Agnes or some other chip. So if you, you have to switch over here or you just get nothing. I had built the power supply. I had switched the jumper. There was no drive attached or anything. I plugged it in and booted the, the whole thing and it delivered a black screen. And that was a bit unfortunate. And there was no way to diagnose any further because black screen just means whatever. So I knew all the custom chips were working. I knew that the processor was getting five volts. I had checked that. So all was good on that front. Then I decided to pull out my Pi Storm, which I had plugged into the Amiga 500. And I thought, hey, let's just plug it into the CPU socket. It has to go in like that. Then you push down and that does not work because there are caps in the way. So this doesn't work. So I went and thought, and then I came up with the idea of some extensions and I put these in and then this whole tower plugged in here. And since I'm using a Raspberry Pi uh, 3B and not the A version, I had to use this adapter to actually fit it onto the Pi. So I have this whole stack of stuff. And I booted with the Pi Storm in my 2000. And then I got a green screen with one blink. And green screen usually means a dead Agnes or some memory problems. So, so I was about to desolder all the memory chips and then I thought, hey, no, wait, can I somehow find out what is going on here? Which memory chip is dead, whatever, if it's one of these um, logic chips which do the addressing of the, the memory and stuff like that. And I looked for the schematics of this machine. And for the Rev4, there are none on the internet. At least I couldn't find some. So I got the Rev6 and these were made by Dave Haney. And I never diagnosed a machine, um, especially not a 16-bit machine, with schematics. So I'm not well, I wasn't good at reading these things and I, I'm not an uh, electrical engineer or anything by trade. I'm a software guy. So I had to try to figure out how this works and maybe let me talk you through this. So maybe it will help you um, if you have to ever go and do this. So the first thing I wanted to do was find the main processor because the main processor must be somehow connected to the memory. And usually the processor does the addressing of the memory. And as you can see here, 
All these A lines are the address lines and these D lines are the data lines. So what I did was I checked where do these lines go and you can see here you have D0 to D15 and you have A1 to A23 and there's a second line or a column of numbers which is 52, 51. Mm -hmm. These are the actual pins on the processor or the IC and there is a third row of numbers which uh, gave me some trouble understanding and that is just um, the program that draws a, drew the schematics numbering all the lines. So if you for example looking it says here A1 to 23 so this means that all these lines connect somewhere off paper so you have to find another paper where these lines connect and if you look here this is another page of this of the same schematics you can see here's a 1 to 23 this is where these go so these go out here and come in here and they end at u500 u500 being the kickstart rom and you can see u500 says right here so every ic every component on the board has its own identifier or label which is unique so we can see that some of the address lines of the 68000 are connected directly to the kickstart rom so that was my first order of business to check those lines so, so you check which address lines come here and you can see that the address lines 1 to 18 end up here so we go over here and we check address line 1 to 18 which is here and then you can just go and put your multimeter for continuity on pin 29 on the 68000 pin 29 on the 68000 and if you want to check for line 1 so the first line here which is address line 1 and you can see there's a line number 1 here which goes to, I have to check, um, pin 9 on the kickstart ROM. So that is where you check continuity. And you do these for all the lines. And they all checked, checked out perfectly well. There was continuity, so the connections between these two, at least for the address lines, were good. I then went and checked the data lines. And these are these over here and as you can see these are connected to u103 u104 u105 u106 which are these sl chips uh, sn chips over here so logic chips which do some switching and stuff like that so i went and i checked all these lines and you can see um, if we check, for example, for, let's say, D2, which is line 2 here, that goes here, and it also goes here. So this goes to U103 and U105. And when I checked um, data line 5, I found out that this had to be connected to U105 and to U103 and none of these connections were present. So that told me that um, the whole data connection from the CPU to the memory which these components um, select, so these chips up here do select the memory addressing over here and that couldn't work because there was a data line missing. So what I did then was I just patched, and I guess this is the first pin down here, to the, I guess it was pin seven over here, and I just used some uh, clip lead to uh, try it. And lo and behold, the machine just booted into Kickstart 2.0. So there was actually battery damage wasn't visible but pin 1 right here had suffered 
and uh, my solution, let me quickly show you, was, my solution was to put a botch wire, a pretty long one, from that pin one on the 68000 to that SN chip. And that is a permanent fix. And uh, yeah, let's take a look at what we get if we power on the machine. So there's currently no, not even boots. Yeah, we, we're getting to the disk drive in a minute, but you can hear it working. And you can see it loading, because there's a mouse pointer. That is my test disk right now. Yeah, and there we have Pinball Wizard and Quibi, which are part of the Amiga Power Pack, which is an original disk. Yeah, so that works like a charm. I left the machine running for a while. Works great. Um, but I didn't have a disk drive. So I ordered one of these floppy cables, which cost me, I guess, seven euros, by the way. Yeah, so next order of business was to take care of this drive. And it has actually a drive uh, front bezel and stuff like that. So I plugged this in and there was no sign of life. I was still able to use the Amiga 500 drive, so I knew that the cable worked and that Gary was good and the CIAs were good, which are responsible for the disk drive. And the jumpers were in the correct setting. And then I decided I wouldn't slaughter my 500 because why should I? All the chips are here, everything works perfectly fine. And so I checked my parts bin and I found an Alps drive. But this is a PC drive, as you can see, or guess. And so I went on the internets to find how to convert a PC drive. And lo and behold, Mark fixes stuff had exactly that video and I remembered having watched that video of Mark's uh, where he converted a drive from uh, PC to Amiga. And even better, it was the exact same drive, which is a DF354H090F of Alps. And uh, yeah, watch Mark's video on how I converted this drive. It took me 10 minutes and Put the board back in, had to replace all the screws with some black ones I had lying around. I also noticed that this case has a little bend here, so it's not completely straight, but it goes like this. And I had to put some rubber below, I can't see that, right there, below the board and the case stand off because uh, else the board would just bent down and that is not good. So next up is uh, fixing my power supply or putting my new shiny power supply into the old less shiny power supply case. Mounting that on there and then mounting that whole assembly in the board uh, or on the board and in the case right here. And then we are almost good to so go. So taking a look inside the power supply you can see where I replaced the uh, resistors right here and there goes the fuse and that all looked a little burnt here. Problem is I can't find any schematics for this power supply so I can't even check if these voltage regulators are good because this is all soldered onto the board and these things are screwed in so there's no way in hell, same here, there are four voltage regulators. I don't have any idea which ones they are. And um, I can't test them from the downside because I don't know which polarity is what. So that is uh, really disconcerting and I can't do anything. I also had to fix that cap over there, just wiggling around. I had to hot glue it in place because the, the solder pad was gone. But um, I'm going to take this whole assembly out of here, just leaving the switch and the um, power socket. And uh, yeah, I will transform this power supply and I will get back to you when it's done. 
Yeah, I just opened the Dell power supply and this is what I got. This is just disgusting and dusty and all kinds of shit. And the worst case is that the PCB actually goes from here to here, which is too wide and too long for this this year to fit in here. So I have a different plan. But first I'm gonna blow out this power supply. I checked and that power supply didn't fit at least the PCB into this power supply. This is the old Amiga power supply. I did remove the fan. I did remove the PCB and I then epoxied the Dell power supply into this case. And uh, yeah, that went pretty well. Then I went and epoxied the little plus five to minus five converter here. I snipped off the ATX um, connector because I have my Amiga connector here. And now I have just one cable strain, which is much nicer. I did some uh, heat tube shrinking, tube heat shrinking, I don't know. And I did connect the power switch from the back of the power supply with the ground wire and that went into this connector and that just plugs into the power supply. So the switch works from the outside, the power connector works from the outside and there's a power supply in here and all that should fit nicely into my um, construction which houses the disk drives and stuff like that. So let me put that in there and uh, see what it does. So maybe before I put it in there, let's just see if it really works. Let's plug it in, power switch, and if this works, the fan should turn. And it does. Nice. I was even able to reuse the cage. I just had to bend this up a little, that it complements the power supply. But that looks quite nice. Great. Now let's put it in. Okay, everything is mounted. You can see that this flap is up here and you can a little bit see into the side cage here. A little cable management going on. Cable for the floppy is just long enough. And um, yeah, floppy is mounted. And I had to do some screw work here. These screws were in here. They are super fat screws, so none of the Standard PC screws still work here, so I had to use the ones that were forced in there. So now let's close it up and fire it up. So here it is in all its glory. I cleaned it. There's my PC drive. I could theoretically put the dead drive in here just for show. That's a huge cavity. That's my A500 mouse. And the case looks pretty good after cleaning. LEDs work and all that stuff. Yeah, so I'm pretty happy with this. For 175 plus shipping, do you think I made a good deal? I don't know. What I didn't show is that also the CPU was a bit uh, butchered. Let me quickly sh see. Yeah, there's a broken leg, there's a broken leg. That was crammed in there, so I had to replace that. And we have these three resistors, which were in the power supply and the fuse, power supply fuse just rolled somewhere, which was also dead. I will of course hunt for these plastic covers so that this is all closed nicely and maybe I will 3D print a uh, new faceplate for the drive so that this gap is closed because I don't like those gaps. But we will see. For now I have a working 2000. Nice. And that concludes this video. Thanks for watching as always and until next time. Bye bye.
Thank you for watching Retro is the New Black. If you are new to the channel please like and subscribe. If you like the video, please share. Every like, share and comment helps a lot. Until next time, bye bye.